Hello everyone, good morning. Sadly, I can't be here this morning. I have some family business to do, but I still want to do the presentation with you and talk with you about transmons, which are qubits and the special thing about them they have a, is that they have a small charge dispersion, which means they don't interact that much which, with charge from outside of the world, which is important for qubits to be stable. So I want to start with talking about why we even want to have quantum computers. By now, probably a lot of you have heard about them, and so did many other people, like governments, pharmaceutical companies, weather stations and banks. And the reason for this is, for example, cr cryptography. Maybe you've seen somewhere that the Shor's algorithm is exponentially, exponentially faster with quantum computers. Which means, and which means that many cryptographic um, security measures can be broken because the algorithm is so fast and people could bypass this keys or this cryptographics with quantum computers. This is like one area where a lot of money is put in because it has a lot of impact on our physical world that we are in. And for us, interesting is this part here, optimization, and especially optimization of computation, because we can computate certain things faster with quantum computers. For example, I'm working on a paper where I implement an algorithm that could have a polynom polynomial speed up of solving differential equations compared to a, compared to a classical computer. And yeah, that would be very, very helpful to have these faster computations. And there's many, many different areas where we could use them. Also for chemistry, it's important and for material science, because instead of simulating a system, you could just put a system in a certain state and then let the state evolve with time. But we will come to this. What I want to show you first is different types of qubits. These are five different types of qubits. Here is like a harmon like an oscillator. You have basically this circuit here that is very common from from our current technological point. We can build the circuits and from the industries that we have it's easy to implement, relatively easy. Another important and promising type of qubit is this trapped ion qubits. For this trapped ion qubits, you basically, as it says, you trap an ion and then you can, if applying a laser with a certain frequency, you can put this electron from one state to the other state. And as we will see this state, let's say this is the zero state here and this is the one, the first excited state. This zero state and this one state, this will be our qubit. This will be then our qubit, the is isolation of this one one state and zero state. So instead of bits having zero and one, we will have qubits in the physical state with the bra and cat notation of bra zero or bra one. But we will not focus on this trapped ion today. We will focus on this superconducting loops. The superconducting loops are produced with, with different companies. Google uses them, IBM uses them and with IBM, you can actually use these qubits. You can you can you have access to IBM's quantum computers, and you can work with them. Yeah, I mean, first let's look. What is this even? How do you implement it? How does it work? What's so nice about qubits, and how does everything look? Here is a very nice picture. I like this contrast a lot. You have here a fridge. And if I say a fridge, it really is a fridge. It cools cools it down gradually. From top, the top is hot, the bottom is cold. It goes from 4 Kelvin to 1 Kelvin to 100 millikelvin and to 15 millikelvin here. And here, down here, is the processor with the qubits. So the calculation happens here and everything above that looks relatively beautiful is just the cooling. And this is called the golden chandelier which is at IBM and the computations happen down here. 
and how you get these low is also very interesting. We saw this also in this course, how you can use magnetic fields to cool systems. Okay, first I want to give you a brief, brief intuition how a transmon works. It looks very simple. This is a transmon, a schematic of it. You have a metal plate here, a metal plate here, and you cool it down to 15 millikelvin, which is colder than outer space. It's crazy enough to think that there's places on Earth colder than the outer space. And these metal plates are cooled down, so they become superconducting. And you connect them with this junction here. This is a Josephson junction, <coughs> which we also talked about at the end of this course. <coughs> and this will be our nonlinear inductor, so it won't obey the Ohm's, Ohm's law, it will be nonlinear. And this metal place and this junction, they are put on this dielectric. And we can symbolize this transmon by this circuit symbol. Here is the capacitor and here is the junction. So this purple part would be this yellow part here. And if we look at a physical picture, then here is a picture of it. This is 100 nanometer. So this is about the thickness of 150 nanometer. And this would be the first metal plate, let's say this one. And here is the second metal plate, this one, and this yellow junction here would be here the part where they connect. Okay, so here is a page full of stuff, and I would try to explain you why we want what we want from a transmon. We all have seen this picture from quantum mechanics. It has the energy states, the first ground state, then the first excited state. And we know that this is unharmonic. Okay, so to get from the zero state to the one state, you need this energy. And to get from the one state to the two state, you need less energy. <coughs> so if you would apply this energy from to go from the zero state to the one state, and then apply it again, you would go up here, and here is no, there is no state to enter here. So what you can, what you essentially do is, with this, if you apply certain energy, you get up here. If you apply it again, you go, you go nowhere. So you can isolate this zero and one state with this. If you compare it to the harmonic oscillator here, okay, this is a diagram of a harmonic oscillator and how it works is on the right side, but for now let's look at this graphics here. If you would apply the same energy frequency here with the photon, then you would go from the ground state to the first excited state, and to go from the first excited state to the second excited state, you would apply the same frequency or the, the same photon with the same energy, so in contrast to this, where you have different energy levels with the different gap size here, you have for the harmonic oscillator, you have the similar gap sizes. And what this means is if you have here the ground state, the first excited state, the second excited state, then applying a photon here twice will lead you to the second excited state. And that's not something we want to have for a bit or for a qubit, because then you can't isolate these two states the zero state and the one state. And we want to isolate them because we want them to be distinguishable. So our goal would be to have something like on the left, in a sense to make, a, to kind of construct this unharmonicity that we see in the quantum world. So we want to change this harmonic oscillator. And here is a picture how the harmonic oscillator works. For those who are interested, I'll not grow through it, but you see the here is the capacitor, which is fully charged. Then the current goes through it. It produces a magnetic field on the right side. You have the analogy with the mass on a spring. And I just put this diagram here because it's very pleasing to see. <laughs> and maybe you can, if you want, you can have a look and compare them. Okay, so what we want from a transmon, 
or from a qubit is to distinguish this one state and the zero state. And we do this by introducing here a nonlinearity. So instead of having this harmonic oscillator, we would want to have here, you see there is an arrow, and this arrow basically implements this purple Josephson junction. So we re replace this inductor here in the harmonic oscillator case with the Josephson junction, which is a nonlinear inductor. And this Josephson junction allows us then to produce an energy spectrum that looks like this. And as you can see here, we have something pretty similar to the, to the atom here. The energy levels, they are again, they have different energy levels, but the spacing between, <coughs> between them is not constant anymore. And this is very good because now we can have the ground state here, the first excited state here, and as it's indicated, if you apply a photon with this frequent, with a certain frequency that puts you from the zero state to the one state, and you do that twice, you jump from here to up here, where there is no state. So we can distinguish the one state and the zero state. Okay, so what we... I found this pretty interesting. This is almost as if we made an artificial atom or an artificial like quantum state zero and quantum state one. And here is a good point to tell you that the big big advantage of using um, qubits instead of normal bits that are used right now when you listen to this in your computer the bits are processed is that here this qubits they are quantum states so they are actually states that course um, that follow quantum mechanics and that means there can be superposition and all the all the wonders of quantum mechanics are inside of this qubit and that's where the power comes from the qubits because these superpositions and these effects of quantum mechanics they can if people can find algorithms to exploit these phenomena of the quantum world then we can um, we can make algorithms way more efficient and we can speed things up by a lot and not only that we can construct states let's say you want to model a molecule then you can create that molecule you can actually create the physical state here of that molecule and then you have a state of it and you let it just evolute you just apply a time evolution so the state um, changes and you see okay what happens with the state at the end what you do is you just have the state you let it live so that it propagates with time and at the end you measure and you see what happened to this state instead of classically you would simulate this but with a qubit you don't have to simulate it you just have to put the qubit in that state and let it let the time evolution happen and see at the end what's the outcome so here with the qubits we can exploit and work with quantum mechanical effects and if you go back to the physical picture here of the qubit where you have the metal plate here the metal plate here that are cooled down to the superconducting state and the josephson junction which is basically the connection part here we have a green part which corresponds to a linear term. This um, epsilon j is a Josephson energy. Here is a cosine. And this, this part here is a magnetic flux and the magnetic flux quantum. And we've seen something similar with the Joseph Josephson AC and DC current. And here it's just for the energy instead of for the current. And we can split this cosine up to get a linear term and a nonlinear term. So the linear term is in green, which would correspond to a linear inductor, and the purple term here would correspond on the right side to this to this Josephson junction nonlinear term. So that would be the part that produces this unharmonicity that we want to have to isolate these two states. So we know now that we can implement or we can have this unharmonicity and now we want to implement it 
and that's a whole different story to go from theory to the physical part and this formula you can ignore all these formulas here is just another depiction of the transform cube of the qubit what's interesting is that the Josephson energy is written here again and it's also in this diagram it's this cosine shaped and gray shaded area and here we have a first order approximation of this energy just the first order approximation of the cosine and that approximation would correspond to this purple dash line okay and what if you look at this we see that down here the approximation is very good very good and on this horizontal axis it's the reduced magnetic flux so basically it's the magnetic flux um, normalized and we see when the magnetic flux is very small then in this regime the first order approximation is almost the same as the actual Josephson energy so we want to we want to exploit this fact and we want to work down here so we want to have very small magnetic flux so that we can operate the qubit in this regime here where the first order approximation is almost the same as the total total Josephson energy and maybe for the ones who are interested here is the harmonic oscillator part and here is the nonlinear part which is which comes from the Josephson junction and the, this phi here is the zero point fluctuation it comes from the zero point fluctuation so we want to be down here in this regime for the qubit and here are some parameters. These slides are from Slatko Minev's Kiskit tutorial, which you can find on YouTube. I just use them. And if you want to find out more about these, you can just go here and see. Um, here they put some parameters for LJ and CJ, which is 65 um, femtofarad. And they plotted here the result. If we, we only are interested in this diagram here and here you see that the energy or the frequency you have to put in to go from the ground state to the first excited state is 5 gigahertz and then to go from the first excited state to the second excited state you need 0 0.3 gigahertz less than you needed before so there is a the unharmonicity is actually visible here and that's what this this diagram is trying to trying to show okay so that's the theory behind it and now if you actually want to work with it and measure stuff with it you have to see what happens here's a Hamiltonian that we again ignore because we don't look at the derivations of it in this talk what I want to emphasize here is that you can have the qubit here with the junction with the Josephson junction and you couple it to your source this can be any source you just want to put some current through this for us it will be photons so you couple it here is a capacitor that just if you connect to two wires you automatically have, have a capacitor here so what you do is you bring a laser here in so you shoot a photon which should reach the qubit and you can shoot a photon you can produce a photon which is a pulse with a certain time length so you make a produce a photon that you want to have acting on the qubit and you can adjust the time length of this photon and that's important so it's time dependent and the photon will also have a phase so we can tune the phase and the time duration of this pulse and the important thing why we why i emphasize that we can these two parameters are important is if we actually look at this unitary operator now it's this part comes out of nowhere but i just want to show you how you can work with this transmon this is an operator which can change the state of the qubit or of the the physical zero or the physical one state it's just an 
unitary operator that we know from quantum mechanics. So you have here this delta z, let's say this delta z is zero. Here is the omega, the omega from before, this is the time length of the pulse. And here the theta is the phase of the pulse. So we can adjust this phase and we can adjust this time, time duration of the pulse to produce different operators. For example, this x operator, if we set theta to pi half, then this term here um, changes so that we get this. The, if we adjust also theta, we can get this term here. So this x operator would correspond to a rotation about around the x-axis. And in a similar way, we can adjust the theta and also the time duration to act on the qubit with this operator, which would correspond to a rotation about the y-axis. So by adjusting the phase and the time duration of this photon, we can implement different operations. We can rotate it around, the, around any axis that we want. And from these rotations around the axis, we can comp combine these rotations and implement different gates. These are called gates which are just operate just operators on the quantum state so we can implement xyz and this is called the hadamard operator which imposes superposition okay so this is all still a theoretic in the real world you don't have a nicely shaped pulse you have you can have noise and you do have noise and we want to reduce this noise so we can interact with this qubit, but nature can interact with it too. So everything that comes in here changes the state. And also the state is, if it's in a certain state, energy leaks out of the state. So it becomes decoherent, and that's characterized by this time t2. So we want the state to be as coherent as possible, and for as long as possible, and we want to reduce this noise. And here is a graphic we're from 2013 where it shows the qubit lifetime for the coherence time over the past few years and we see an exponential growth of the qubit lifetime so people are working <coughs> hard and also with good results on this to increase this qubit lifetime <coughs> and what this cavity is I can show it to you here. So to reduce the charge noise or to reduce the noise from the environment and increase the coherence time, we can, instead of just having the qubit here, we can couple the qubit to a classical harmonic oscillator here. So what this does is now we have, instead of just having this, we have the qubit coupled to this. And here we see, here I can explain you what this does. So this is what we are looking at now. You can put in a signal, and if you put in a signal, the signal goes through, and it gets reflected and comes back. And since the harmonic oscillator and the qubit here are coupled together, the state of the harmonic oscillator will harmonic oscillator will harmonic oscillator will depend on the qubit state. If the qubit is in the state zero, or if it's in the qubit, qubit is in the state one. Let's say the qubit, the qubit here is in the state zero. Then the resonance frequency of this harmonic oscillator will be different than it will be in, than if it if the qubit was in the state one. Okay, I said that very complicatedly, but this graph <coughs> shows it very clearly. If the qubit is in the state zero, then here the resonance frequency is at the peak here at this frequency. So if you put in a signal and measure different frequencies and you see, okay, at this frequency, you have a very big response, then you know with certain probability that the qubit is in the state zero. And if you measure this frequency, then you know, okay, the qubit is very likely in the state one. And this cavity here, or this harmonic oscillator, essentially reduces the charge noise. Instead of the energy just going through this and leaving it has to go through this and then here is the harmonic oscillator which acts like a damping to noise to protect the qubit from charge noise 
and in the same way instead of energy leaking out of the qubit also energy coming in in the form of noise this harmonic oscillator oscillator will protect the qubit from it so um, unfortunately we can't have a talk or a discussion about this but i hope you have a good morning and i hope you had some fun and saw new things today and if you still have questions you can just ask me or yeah see you soon